lagi. of a story do you call this? Who wrote it? Dolan. Oh, Dolan, eh? Well, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Fine. Dolan. The greatest ruby in the world is stolen, and all you fellas can do is stand there. Get me a story, a feature. Involve a woman in it. But, Chief, there's no woman in the case. Oh, no woman in it. The Coral Ruby is stolen and you stand there and tell me there's no woman in it. There's got to be a woman in it. Got to be. Where's your human interest? Your romance? Your love? Oh, what's the point of talking to you? Get me that crime expert I sent for. He'll find me a woman. He'll find me a dozen women. Well, he said he'd be here at 10 o'clock. Yeah, what time is it now? He's late. Doesn't he know that an appointment with me is almost sacred? If I remember right, nothing's sacred to Melville. Oh, is that so? Well, he'll have to be trained, see? If I remember right, he don't train easy. Uh-huh. You get out. When Melville comes, shoot him in. If I remember right, he'll shoot himself in. What can I do for you, son? Uh, tell the managing editor George Melville's here. Where? You're looking at him. The great Melville in person? Well, who am I to disagree with you? This way, champ. Gangway, gents. It's George Merrillville. Hiya, slaves. Oh, hi, George. Oh, how's the criminologist? Only oh, terrific. What brings you down to these parts, me lad? Well, just a little thing they needed a good writer for. Funny, I felt that. Say, George, I read your last crime story. That is, I hope it's your last. Cephalic. Pure cephalic. You want to watch your private vices, Mac? Lead on, McDuff. Who? No, no, tell him I'm dead. Wait, I, I'm not dead to him. Hello? No, no, throw that tripe in the sewer. Well, what do you want? What do you want? Wait, don't tell me. You're Melville. Right. Yes, what time is it? You're late. People who work for me keep their appointments on time. Well, it's a very nice rule, but I don't happen to be working for you yet. I say, you're quite a crime writer, aren't you? Not bad. Yeah, you got hundreds of people reading these silly stories of yours, too, haven't you? Thousands. What do you think you know about this ruby mystery? You'd be surprised. I want to be surprised. My readers want to be surprised. The columns of this paper are wide open to any young fool who can make an ass of himself entertainingly. Thank you. Now, all I want is circulation. If you can involve a woman in this case and a haunted castle... I'm sorry, I can't give you a woman or a castle. The best I can do is an international crook of 45 years of age. Suave, educated, visionary, and crazy. Crazy? Crazy, obsessed over beauty. Say, uh, you're not kidding, are you? You really know something about this? Sure. All right, come on, come on, out with it. What do you know? Well, that's what I'm to be paid for. Oh, fifty dollars a story. Seventy-five. All right, all right, seventy-five. But I want copy. If you can put your finger on this crazy oh, murderer. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't say I could catch him. Oh, but you knew where he was. Well, sure, but he's supposed to have been dead for four years. Dead? Uh uh. I won't have. Look here. You go outside there and get yourself a typewriter and go to work. Here. Huh? you are knocking them for a loop. All in a day's work, Otto. How about a cheese sandwich and a glass of beer? <laughs> the four are in the back room, and they was just reading your article, and I was telling them that if they studied it real hard, they might get to be smart fellows like you. I bet that made a hit. Thanks, Otto. You are welcome. You're a man of sound judgment. I thank you very much. 
And he gets money for acting like a lunatic in public. Nobody but a loose-brained idiot would break out all over the front page with a prediction like that. Did it ever occur to you boys that he might get lucky again and be right about this burly crook? Yeah, well, if that happens, I'm leaving town. I couldn't stand it. Hello, pals. Uh, oh, well, hello, hello, George. 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 We were just hello. talking hello. about you. Yeah. Were you? Hello, George. Hello, Mark. How's the playwright? I don't know. I think there's a leakage of the libido. I see you've had a play in rehearsal for about three months. When's it coming off? Oh, any month now. What's the delay? I see producer. Keeps remodeling the theater. Spending a fortune. And all I do is rewrite and rewrite. Too bad uh, George didn't see your script before you started. Now, you know, he might have given you some good suggestions. Yeah, too bad. Well, boys, how'd you like to take a little trimming in a game of pool? I'll spot you 15 points. Okay, you're just the guy we'd like to take. All right. Just for that, I'll spot you 20 points. Well, 10 then. cents a point. This gets interesting. Then come on in, baby, come on in. Oh, boy, rack them up. Odd man. Your break. You boys don't live right. Well, I'll take it easy to start with. Fifteen ball in the corner. Well, I'll make a soft one for you. Bank the nine. You always call your shots, don't you? Never miss. You don't think you're gonna miss on this yarn you're writing for the paper? Bob Berlea? I wouldn't kid my best friends, would I? So I'll tell you this. When I write that Andrew Berlea is still living, I'm writing facts. Oh, come on, George. The police said he was killed in Vienna. Do they? Do they also say who stole that Stradivarius in Rome in 1933? Or the three Cellinis from the Archduke of Liarhaven in 1934, long after Berlea was supposed to be dead? That could have been anybody. No, you're wrong. Berlea's right here in America. It's only just started. Remember, Berlay is no ordinary type of crook. He's a rich man who steals because of a passion, a love of art treasures. Nothing he ever touched was for sale. So, well, so right now, he's the possessor of the Coral Ruby. Five ball in that corner. Good shot. You want to stick the pool and let the police have crimes. You think so? What would you say if I told you the next sensational robbery was going to be the Sunburst Diamond? Oh, lay off, George. The Sunburst Diamond is in the vaults of the Commercial National Bank. Everybody knows that. You're right. Everybody does know it, including Berlea. It's one of the most valuable collector's items in the country. And Berlea won't rest until he gets it. You're crazy. All right, I'm crazy. I'll tell you something else. Within 24 hours, there's going to be another sensational murder in connection with the theft of the Coral Ruby. There'll be a what? Another murder. The owner's butler. According to reports, he got a look at Berlea. Berlea doesn't like that one bit. Uh, tell us, Master, how do you arrive at these marvelous conclusions? Well, I'll tell you. It's very simple. You merely add up the facts in any case, think clearly, and keep your motive straight. You know, I saw a motive once, but I took an aspirin and went away. <laughs> <laughs> of course, not everyone can do it. You have to be built right. Take ordinary men like yourselves. Now, you couldn't add up facts correctly because you'd let impulse and sentiment get in the way. Whereas, on the other hand, take a superior type of person like myself. Old Stony Heart the first. Stony Heart, but a clear eye. Now, take this simple illustration, one you boys can understand. Take a case involving a beautiful woman. Now, you'd fail because you'd see a beautiful woman. Whereas, I would succeed because my criminologist eye would see her as no more than a possible clue. Boy? You should have seen the clue I was out with last night. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Melville, Mr. Melville, Mr. Blaine just called that for you to hurry over to the Gazette right away. Somebody has been murdered. Murdered? Who? Oh, I couldn't catch the name. Somebody's butler. Well, as long as this is the last shot, I might as well make it a tough one. Put your cue down, will you? Just terrific. Well, Mark, I'll look in on your rehearsals. I can undoubtedly be of some assistance. Gentlemen, how those balls drunk the cue? How can you live with a guy like that? Boys, we have reached a crisis. Thank <laughs> you. 
help me, please? Do you help me, please? Will you help me, please? I'm desperate. I must have help. that cab. Yes. Hurry it up. Yes, ma'am? A facial and a shampoo, please. Miss Arno. Facial and shampoo. This way, please. Yes, please. Maxie. And it all? Well. What are you going to do? Get in here. Where to? Driver, go through the park, please. Yes, ma'am. Well, you've managed to become quite attractive on my money. I'll just steal it. Oh, I don't know. I didn't mean to. I I followed you in the crowd. Uh-huh. Well, you better not cry. You'll ruin that expensive makeup. Oh, listen to me, please. I've never stolen anything in my life before. Tonight I had to, because I've waited three years for tonight. What? Oh, it's so difficult to explain. Would you... Could you trust me for just, just a few hours? I suppose that's an awful lot to ask of a man you've just robbed. Well, I suppose it's a great deal to ask you, but uh, uh, could you tell me what you want those few hours for? At 8 o'clock, I want to see someone. Oh, I see. And I'm supposed to wait on some street corner for you to come back and give yourself up. Oh, no, no. If you don't believe me, you can come with me. That'd spoil your game, wouldn't it? There isn't any game. Come with me, will you, please? Till 8 o'clock? Yes. All right, I'll give you a couple of hours. All right. What do we do between now and 8 o'clock? It doesn't matter. I'd take you to dinner if you have any of my money left. Feeding the thief who robbed you. That's Christian charity, I believe. The Biltmore. Well, in about an hour, we'll be going to the police station. You know that, don't you? Yes. Aren't you frightened? Of what? Prison. No, I'm not frightened. At least you're not morbid about it. Where do we go at 8 o'clock? 210 Sutter Place, Larchmont. Well, that's a nice address. What have you got to do with it? It was my home. Oh, I see. Well, now, suppose you tell me the whole story. You know, I don't mind a lot. It's well done. Who lives at 210 Sutter Place now? My husband. That is, he, he was my husband. He divorced me. 
a nice beginning. Uh, go on. I'll bet he was cruel. He was. And I ran away with another man. Rather an ordinary lie, isn't it? Well, what happened? We separated. Since then, I've, I've just been living one way or another. Yes, one does, one way or another. Now, uh, granting that your story is true, haven't you ever tried to pull yourself together? Oh, yes, many times I'm still trying. Because I, I really have someone to live for. Who? My child. I beg your pardon? She's four years old today. This is her birthday. You see, that's the reason I, I stole your money. Aren't you getting yourself a little bit tangled up? No. No, you see, ever since I, I left my husband, he's never allowed me to see her. I've written to him every year, begging him to let me see her for a few minutes on her birthday. I wanted to bring her a toy or something, so she'd know her mother remembered her. He's never answered me until today. I'm going to be with her tonight. And so you celebrated by stealing. Oh, I couldn't let her see me the way I was. You, you don't believe a word I said, do you? Yeah, but you mustn't mind me. I was born cynical. And with no sentiment. Yes, perhaps you're right. Please, could we start now? I don't want to be late. Wait here, Professor. Please tell Mr. Northrop that Mrs. Northrop is here. Mr. Northrop is expecting you. Where is she? You're looking very well. I expected you to come alone. Oh, this is Mr. Melville. I couldn't keep you and your child apart after all your pathetic letters. Oh, where is she? In the music room. Perhaps you've forgotten the way. I'll show you. Does she know I'm coming? She knows nothing. It happened the day before yesterday, the day I received your annual request. Under the circumstances, I thought I could accede to it. It'll do no harm now. and try to go to sleep. I can't stay here. Why not? Are you somewhere else to go? No. Well, then that settles it. All in one go. That's a good girl. Is there anything else I can do? Her ring. He must have it. Could you get it for me, please? I'd be delighted to pay that gentleman another visit. I'll be back just as soon as I can. Oh, the watchman. 
Who did you expect? Now, the butler, if you don't mind. Oh, if I don't mind, is it? Well, there ain't no butler. Can't you tell an empty house when you see one? Well, I was here early this evening. The owner's daughter. The owner's in Europe. He hadn't any daughter. The man subletting is out of town, and he hadn't any daughter. And the gate is out there. Good night, young fella. Good night. What's the number here? Two hundred and ten. Stay right where you are. Who are you? That should be my question. It's my house. Are you a thief? No. I didn't think so. Not with that face and that necktie. Oh, you like my necktie? I was just admiring yours. Then should we? Why not? It's a beautiful pin. Rare stone. Ah, not everyone would know that. Of course, you won't mind telling me why you broke into my house. Well, not at all. I was here earlier this evening, and uh, things were quite different. Extraordinary, isn't it? Amazing. At least it served its purpose. Oh, there was a purpose. Oh, quite. You're here, and of course we can't let you go out alive. You'd have a better knot if you made two loops with that tie. Oh, thank you. Wouldn't my death prove rather dangerous to you? Not at all. You broke into my house, and I mistook you for a burglar. I see. I also stole your tie. So you did. Of course, you know the whole thing was a trick to get you here. But why? Because you know too much. You're wrong, Mr. Gregory. He thinks knows too much. Hi, George, old stony heart. Just take the impulse and sentiment out of it. And look at a woman with that good old clear eye. <laughs> <laughs> How do you like meeting with a chin, wise guy? Uh, somebody had to trim your sails, you big criminologist, you. Well, what, what's this all about, boys? Meet some of the members of my cast. Your cast? That's Mr. Rupert. It was getting impossible to live with a superman like you, so we thought we would prove you're just an ordinary human being. He's human. I can vouch for him. Here's your money, except for the price of the dinners. And this uh, lady in distress, is she also a member of your cast? Yes, indeed. Some clue, eh, boy? She's quite an actress. A and this is Mr. Gregory, my producer. How do you do, Mr. Melville? I took part in this little hoax because I wanted to meet you. I've been reading your articles. They're very interesting. Thank you. I'm glad you liked them. I didn't think you were so young. There's a ring of authority about what you have to say. Mark tells me you predicted the murder of the butler. Holy mackerel, don't bring that up again. Just another lucky guess. <laughs> See, the boys are very fond of me. 
Well, I'll buy the drinks. I feel terribly guilty. Will you forgive me? You know, you're beautiful when you suffer. <laughs> and in your tender moments, you're irresistible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they'd like to be alone. Sounds like guns. It's right next door. Who lives there? The Sherman. I don't want to miss this. Officer! Officer! What's happened? The painting's been stolen. Painting? Yeah, a painting by a guy named Van Hine. Oh, sure, the Van Hine's painting. What do you mean, sure? Well, I knew that was going to be taken next. You, you what? what? Well, I could have predicted it. You hear that? We teach him a good lesson and now he's off again. Hey, won't anything stop you? Come on, Mr. Melville, I don't think they believe you. Go on, reporters. Grab yourself a story for the Gazette. You know, that's a funny thing. I knew that was going to happen. I just neglected to say so. You don't really mean that. Well, certainly I do. Could they be right about you? What'd they say? That you're terrific. Yeah, that's right. Find some excitement. Yes, sir. I understand it was the Van Eyne's painting. Quite a treasure. Oh, yes, sir. Priceless. From the looks of it, sir, a very successful theft. No one caught or suspected? No, sir. Well, well. Amazing, it's alive. The brushwork, the flesh tones. Incredibly wonderful. A work of genius, gentlemen. The greatest expression of the human mind. You're asking yourselves whether this bit of canvas was worth the effort it required to bring it here. It is to me, gentlemen. I've dreamed of possessing this painting for 20 years. It would be difficult to explain how I feel towards it. You've done a splendid bit of work. Yes, John? The Melville boy saw Mr. Payton directly home last night, sir. Then he's luncheon for today. After that, Melville went to his newspaper office and, uh, judging by the morning gazette, he wrote a little piece about the theft of the painting. Yes, remarkable boy. Very positive now that Berlair is alive, isn't he? Yes, the theft of the painting has convinced him. He seems to be slipping, however. He didn't predict that the painting would be stolen. But I heard him say that he could have predicted it. I believe he could have, because he knew. How? Oh. I'm not sure yet. I've only a theory. I believe that he's a man very much like myself, with a highly developed appreciation of works of art. Only such a man could make such shrewd deductions about me. I believe that the love of beauty that made me an accomplished thief has made him an accomplished criminologist. That's merely my guess at present. I shall find out for certain. Well, if you find it's true, Oughtn't we to take steps to stop any further predictions from the young man? Oh, no. This is an unusual case. For the first time, I've met an antagonist I respect. Since such a man challenges me, I should never forgive myself if I answered that challenge crudely. I'd rather outwit such a man than have gained the possession of that masterpiece. Mr. Gibbs. Chime in. Oh, hello, Mr. Gregory. We're going to run for part of the first act. You care to watch it? Of course, be glad to. Come along, John. Lunch, folks. Back in two hours. Hold them, Remy, hold them. Have them run through it again, will you? I want Mr. Gregory to see. All right, what's more? In your places. Uh, Mr. Gregory, would you mind if we did it a little later? I have a luncheon engagement. That's all right. I'll see it this afternoon. Oh, thank you. And here I was, counting on your lunching with me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Interesting. I don't know yet. Ritz? Well, it's a gamble. <laughs> well, run along, but you're spoiling a perfectly good day for me. <laughs> we'll make it tomorrow. Hmm? All right, tomorrow. you have to have lunch with you today. Yes, of course. Miss Peyton, I was going to meet you at the theater. Well, the theater's back there. Oh. Now, that's the kind of a fellow who doesn't know where he's going. How do you know? Well, he's the type that'll start across the street, stop and think, change his mind, turn back. You don't say. Yes, let, let's watch him.
there. What did I tell you? I can always tell his type. How'd you guess it? Well, that's not guesswork, my dear young lady. That's the study of human nature. Uh, study me while. Am I hungry? Yes, you're hungry. <laughs> Where shall we go, the Biltmore or the Ritz? Well, I tell you, we'll flip a coin. Heads, it's the Biltmore. Tails, it's the Ritz. Shrunk. Oh, you, you thought you were going to the Ritz. <laughs> yes, you remember we said the Ritz. <sighs> oh, now, isn't that funny? You know, I always call this place the Ritz, and so naturally I yes, thought... Uh, just a mistake. <laughs> Let's sit down, won't you? You know, you're going to like this much better than the other Ritz. In the first place, there's more privacy, nicer atmosphere, and much better service. Where's the food? Oh, the food. Pierre! Pierre! Will you pardon me while I dig up Pierre? This way, please, madame. And what will madame have for lunch? Listen, Pierre, when you say lunch, I hope you mean it, because madame is hungry. <laughs> this is wonderful, madame. Uh, what do you suggest? Well, of course, uh, madame knows the excellence of the Ritz cuisine. Everything is delish. Uh, oh. Uh, perhaps something from the uh, cold buffet. Oh. The buffet for what, n'est-ce pas? Oui, madame. Uh, let's see, yeah. Jambon de Virginie, poulet for what? Baron Daniel Sousmont. Excellent. And uh, could you step on it, Pierre? Oh, but of course, madame. Nothing but the best. Ah, what a treat for madame. After all, there is no greater delight in life than fine food. Delicately prepared. What a treat. And I'm so hungry. Now, anything you get will be too good for you. You know that, don't you? Yes. Yes. In fact, I think it's darn nice of me to have you here to lunch at all, after what you did to me last night. Well, what'd you invite me for, then? I don't know. I guess it's because you've got black eyes and a pug nose and a fat, round face. Because when you walk, you waddle like a duck. Mm. Now, aren't you having to come to lunch with me? I didn't want to. But then I thought it might be fun lunching with someone who's touched in the head. Oh. So you think I'm a little touched? Did you hear that or did you reach your own conclusion? Both. Is it normal for people to look in crystals and make predictions? No, ah, but I do it with intellect and intelligence and my own little brain. Did you say little? Go on. Oh, no, it's too long a story. I'll tell you the next time we have lunch together. You'd better tell me now, because there might not be any next time. You're on there, lady. My crystal tells me that we're going to see a lot of each other. You'll find the bread in the bread box. Be careful of the knife when you cut it. It's very sharp. What I like about the Ritz is the service. And now about myself. In the first place, I was born very young. I was extraordinary, even as a youth. Uh, the most noteworthy thing about me, boy and man, was a, was a dynamic something. A raging energy to be up and doing. You know, overactive mind. Always searching in strange channels for strange knowledge. You, you'll find the butter in the icebox. Uh, why don't you just relax, Mr. Melville? There you have the story of my life. That, my dear young lady, is the reason why when other men must use guesswork, a Melville is able to predict. Oh, come in. Hello. Well, I thought you were lunching at the Ritz. So did I. So she is. Oh. Don't let me break up this little luncheon. Oh, not at all. What's on your mind? Oh, a little business matter I wanted to discuss with you. Uh, would you like to discuss your business over lunch? Yes, do, Mr. Gregory. Thank you.
quite a place. You better tell him what he's joining first. Oh, yes, we're having, uh, I love beans. <laughs> Little girl, make it three. You know, of course, you've some very fine pieces. Oh, they're mostly reproductions. I have one or two originals, though, that practically made a pauper out of me. I had to have them. Amazing. What do you mean? I mean you. A young man with your tastes is a little unusual in this age. He knows it. He's just been telling me. Excuse me. This is not an imitation. Better not be. Cost me 1,100 bucks. It's a true empire piece. As good as I've ever seen. In fact, it's what you Americans would call the real McCoy. <laughs> Cost me practically every penny my first book made. It didn't sell quite as well as I thought it would. But the book was terrific. It was the public's fault it didn't sell. That's right. Thank you. Delicious. Best beans I've ever eaten. And why? The cook. The cook makes all the difference. I was thinking the same thing. In fact, with respect to Miss Payton, at least, you and I seem to have identical tastes, Melville. Gentlemen, you make me proud. I hope you fight over me. <laughs> I can't do that. I happen to need him at the moment. Oh, yes? Yes, it's very confidential. May I? Oh, please. I brought you the manuscript of Mark's play. There are two or three scenes in it that I'm not altogether satisfied with. It occurred to me from reading your newspaper work and your detective stories that your judgment on these scenes would be very valuable. Mr. Melville agrees with you. Yeah, it's right down my alley. What would a few hours of your time be worth? Should we say $200? Well, I'll have to think of that a little. But not much. Now, I'll accept your offer, Mr. Gregory. Fine. Do you think you could leave off trailing this Belair person long enough to give me those few hours? Um, offhand, I'd say you could do both with the greatest of these. You see, I've been trailing Belair for so long that I can do 50 other things at the same time and still keep him where I can shake a stick at him. I really think you're convinced that Belair lied. You amaze me. Will you please tell me how you can dispute the verified reports of Belair's death? I can. Then how in heaven's name can you go on and make these outlandish predictions of thefts by a man you've no reason to believe is alive? Because I know that he is. I think I know better than anyone else in the world just what sort of a man this Belair is. All his life, he's had a mania to possess beautiful things. He had the money to buy them, but they were not for sale. He turned beef because he had to have them. A few years before his reported death, Berlea came to this country to try and buy the coral ruby, the sunburst diamond, and the Van Hines painting. They were not for sale. Two years pass. First, the coral ruby is stolen. Next, Van Hines painting. That means to me that Berlea is still alive. One moment. Do you imply that the sunburst diamond will be stolen next? <laughs> I'm not only implying it, I'm predicting it. And are you telling us that Mr. Belair is going to slip into the vaults of the commercial bank, pick up the sunburst diamond between thumb and forefinger and skedaddle? I don't know how it'll be done, but it'll be done. <laughs> Melville, you've the greatest imagination of any man I've ever met. And if it isn't imagination, you're a genius. Well, I must be going. Thanks for the beans. Oh, so glad you like them. You'll look over the script, won't you? For $200, he'd write you a new play. Well, I've never tried, but I think I could. I'm coming with you, Mr. Gregory. I'm afraid to be left alone with this crystal game. You're going to stay right here. Goodbye. Goodbye. He's a nice fellow. Now, Georgie, I'm going to call you Georgie because I'm going to talk to you like a mother. Why do you make yourself ridiculous before a man of Mr. Gregory's intelligence? Now, Claire, I'm going to call you Claire because I don't want to be a father to you. You know the prediction I made about the sunburst diamond being stolen? You'll take it back, of course. I'll do better than that. I'll, it's going to happen Saturday night. What? This Saturday night. Furthermore, I'll write a complete description of what's going to happen. And I'll get my paper to have the presses all ready so that there'll be an extra out on the street just three minutes after it happens. What do you think of that? I think you're out of your mind. Maybe you're right. I'm pretty sure what I'm talking about. I'd be an awful idiot to put my head in a noose like that. But you're sure of what you're talking about, hmm? Oh, yes. Well, I'd love to see your head in a noose, and I dare you to do exactly what you said. You mean write that special extra? Yes. All right. What will you bet it doesn't happen just as I say? Name your poison. If my prediction's right, you have to kiss me and mean it. And if you're wrong? You name it. 
All right, I will. Now for a final checkup. Release it. This was our position at six o'clock this morning, correct? That's correct. Get me Dario. I think finding our position at this minute, we can determine whether we should be ready this Saturday night. Hold it, boys. Hold it there. Yes, sir? I should say we're within a foot and a half of the side of the bank vault. That brings us to the wall of the vault in eight hours. Proceeding exactly as you've been doing, that is slowly and taking no chances. Drilling only when the subway passes. Go back to work. Okay. All right, fellas, step on. I think with one more rehearsal tonight, we'll have things perfected for Saturday night. From now on, you'll allow no more changes in the script. Is that understood, Ridley? Yes, sir. Because we'll have the time to a fraction of a second, and the insertion of an extra word or movement on the stage would naturally throw off that calculation. This communication with the basement we'll use only to give a check-up signal, or in case anything occurs, to retard our movements on stage. The cannon report on stage must coincide to a fraction of a second with the blasting of the bank vault. Our success, gentlemen, depends entirely on the accuracy of our watch. This is your position. When Michael pushes up through the trap door to give me my signal to go down, it's your job not to allow that trap door to open if you've the slightest suspicion that the movement is likely to be seen. By keeping an eye on your watch, you should be able to end second when that trap door will open. Miss Payton to see you. In a moment. Replace it. Until our private rehearsal tonight, the set is definite. Miss Payton. Well, I see you came out alive. <laughs> did you ever see anything like him? Frankly, I never did. Oh, after you left, he really got started. More about them. Everything. Exactly what? Well, it's going to be stolen from the bank this Saturday night. He's writing an article now telling exactly how it's going to happen. And three minutes after the robbery takes place, we'll be reading a special extra about it. <laughs> that, I should say, is what you Americans call going to town. He made me so mad I dared him to go through with it. Now I'm beginning to feel sorry for him. Maybe we ought to stop him. Not all. Let him go right ahead. After all, he's made some astounding predictions. If this one comes off, he'll be a famous man. And you've no moral right to dissuade him from using his own excellent judgment. Come in. Oh, hello, Claire. Hello. Do you want to watch it now? I was waiting for you. Well, I'd better go down. And tomorrow, you're lunching with me. At the Ritz. <laughs> All right. Gregory. Yes, Mark? The boys have been ribbing me brutally about the delays in opening the show. My nerves were all a bundle of rags. For a month now, they've been offering best that it never would open. But today I fixed them. Knowing that we would positively open this Saturday night, I took every bet in sight. I acted like I was an angry, desperate man and put up my last dollar. They grant some fun, eh? <laughs> we're not opening Saturday night. <laughs> We're not opening Saturday night? Well, there you have it, gentlemen. According to Melville, the Sunburst Diamond will be stolen from the bank on Saturday night about 11 o'clock. I sent for you because I was a case for the federal government. How does that guy get that way? I don't know any more about it than you do. But remember this, no matter how crazy you think that kid may be, some of his predictions have come true. Now, there's one chance in 10 that this might. Are you suggesting that we call out the whole department and the writings of a guy with hallucinations? Chief, I'm simply presenting the facts to you as I have them. My only interest in this case is that if it does come off, I'll scoop every newspaper in this town. And I don't mind telling you for the benefit of my paper that I hope the robbery happens exactly as Melville says it will. I got them all planted, Chief. All right, that's fine. You and Jim watch the theater entrance. I'll stay here. Okay. Hello? What? Certainly stick around. Everybody stick around. Don't let anybody go home. Keep those forms open. 
We roll any minute. We're ready to go, Chief, whenever you say the word. Nine minutes. Oh, heavens, what some men do while some men leave to do. How some men creep through skittish fortunes hall while others play the idiots in her eyes. I'll know an idiot if this doesn't come off. Eight minutes. Oh, really? Look at the stars. They're winking at me. They know it's us, too. Did that call come in? Well, let me have that call the minute it comes in. Yeah. Nothing, Chief. Just a couple of kids in the forward back firing. Do you hear any little boys shouting extra? I'm darned if I do. You don't suppose that diamond wasn't stolen, do you? Well, now you've got something there. Maybe it wasn't. Quarter three now. Gee, that's late, isn't it? It's Sunday. Good thing I don't have to rehearse today. Coffee? Coffee. Mr. Melville, your editor phoned and said if you showed up here to send you right over. I'll have a cup of strong black coffee, please. Did you hear me, Mr. Melville? Yes, 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 I heard you. Bring me a cup of black coffee. Please. wrong with Mr. Melville? No. Nice boy, hmm? Lovely. Smart, too. And if you are a smart girl, you hang on to a fellow like that. But I bet I don't have to tell you that. In fact, I can see in your eyes that you are crazy about him. I need glasses, my friend. I need glasses? Hmm. 
Hi, Tony. Glasses. Hey, what's the excitement? What's the idea of dragging us down here this time of the morning? Anything break? Who killed who? Get a load of this, boys. The great Melville scooped himself. What's this? When is this supposed to happen? Well, don't you get it? Look at the date. It was supposed to happen three hours ago. It's another Melville prediction, boys. And the old man Felford had the paper all set up. Where is this guy? This is one time I'd like to see him. <laughs> so would the old man. Well, here comes the conquering hero now. Huh? Well, well, hi. That's it. Did you hear the news, George? No, what? Well, you know, the Commercial National Bank. Yes, what about it? Well, it wasn't held up. Oh, wasn't it? No. Come in, come in, Melville. Well, well. But don't sit down, because you're not going to stay very long. Have you heard the latest news? And the Commercial National Bank wasn't held up. Ain't that surprising? And you predicted it was going to be held up. Well, now listen. I did listen. My presses are all set up. Trucks are waiting for the addition to come out on the street. Every press man on the Gazette has been up all night, hasn't slept a wink. Every federal agent in town is guarding that bank, and you asked me to listen. Why, I'm a laughing stock to every newspaper man in this town. Not to mention the cost of the paper. Not to mention a libel suit with the bank. Not to mention that the federal department thinks I'm an idiot. You ask me to listen. No, no, I do want a light from you. Now, you listen to me, Sherlock. You're through. You're fired. You'll never get another job as a newspaper man as long as you live. I'll see to that. Oh, now, listen, Chief. Did you say listen? Thanks. Chief was kind of sore. No, I wonder why. Now, why should the chief be sore at you? Well, you see, it's like this. I went in and told him I was going to quit. You know how I'd feel about that. Oh, sure, sure. Well, now that the boss let you quit, how about throwing a farewell party? Yeah, I was just going to suggest that. Yeah. Come on. I don't know how we're going to get along without you, Georgie. Well, that leaves the Gazette without a guy that can predict things. Oh, Melvin will let us feel. Slip the Gazette some red hot predictions, won't you, George? Otto, see what the boys will have. It's on me. Scotch and Give me a high Otto. Take my glass of beer. High Celebration? Yeah, Melville got a raise. Yeah, right out of the Gazette. Well, that's one he didn't predict. How come you didn't pick that one, George? Are you really out, George? Like a light. But that's marvelous. Now you can take the job in Chicago. Here he is, offered a magnificent job to edit True Crime Stories magazine at a fortune a week, and that old meanie of an editor wouldn't let him go. So I says, George, why don't you make a whopper of a prediction? Cost the boss a lot of money, and he'll have to fire you. And it worked. Oh, yeah? Very pretty, if true. You don't say. You can't sell us that one, sister. Come on, George, I'll help you pack. Here you are. <laughs> Thanks for the phony story. I had to do something you looked so miserable. Why do you let them talk to you like that? What could I say? I was fired. Well, what of it? That ought to be an easy enough situation for you to handle. That'll hold George for a while. Yeah, well, I'm going home and get some sleep. Well, things have come to a pretty pass when the great Melville has to hide in an alley. <laughs> George. George. What? What's the matter? Me? You're not going to be silly about this, are you? Me? What's the matter with you and staying me? Well, I was canned. That's never happened to me before. You're kidding. No, you don't understand. I'm washed up through. I won't be able to get another job in this town. You talk like a child, George. What do you want, an easy, well-oiled existence? That's no fun. You'll probably lose a lot of jobs and things. What are you going to do about it? Sit down and, and hold your head and mope? Human dynamos don't mope. Oh, Georgie. It's too funny me talking to you like this. I'm sorry. I just haven't got it. Not even a snicker. Do you remember our bet? Yeah. I lost. What have you been eating?
Have the costumes here Friday for dress rehearsal. We positively open Saturday night. Good morning, Claire. Good morning. Did you want to see me? Yes, I've made an appointment with the costumers for this afternoon for you. Oh, good. Thank you. Have a pleasant weekend. Uh, I was taking care of an invalid. Invalid who? Mr. Melville. Melville? What's wrong with him? Oh, everything, apparently. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Did you have a doctor? Oh, there's nothing a doctor can do. He's just completely lost all confidence in himself. Strange as it may seem. What caused it? Well, it all started with that horrible prediction. Then his editor fired him, told him he'd never get another job. He's really quite pitiful. He won't eat, he won't go out of the house. He's puttering around with some clay, modeling something or other. He doesn't know what it is. Well, this is serious. We have a half hour before rehearsal. Let's run over and see it. Oh, I was going to ask you to do that. All right, let's go. Mr. Gregory. What are you doing here? Oh, just, just sitting. How long have you been here? Oh, half an hour, an hour, maybe longer. Well, why? The play. Well, what about the play? It won't go. It just won't go. Now, I sit at home reading and reading and reading and nothing happens. So I say to myself, George, I say, why don't you go down and sit in no man's land and read some more? Maybe something will happen. Oh, but nothing happened. What on earth are you doing? You're putting dirt in your pockets. Um, Me? I never heard of such a thing. I don't know why I did that. Kind of silly, isn't it? Come, my boy, you don't want to be sitting here on a pile of rock and dirt. Oh, hello, Mr. Gregory. I wanted to see you. This is a marvelous play. Every line's a gem. I, I bet you one of them. And, uh... Here's your, your $200. It's, it's only $190 now because I gave the boys a blowout. <laughs> well, bye. Wait a minute, don't go. No, no, I've got to go. I, I'm very busy. Lovely. Yeah, it's a honey. What is it? That's a map. It's a map of New York. Well, there's nothing more entertaining than a map of New York. What are you doing with it? Who, me? Yes. You mean this? Yes. Oh, that. <laughs> Say, do you realize what you're sitting on? Rock. You know what I'm sitting on? Rock. All New York is built on a rock foundation. You never knew that, did you? Yes. Well, there you are. There's always something you don't know. Thank you very much. What have you been eating today? Oh, I, I've had to. That's no kind of food for a great big fellow like you. How's the show coming on? All right, we open Saturday night. No, you can't open that play. You mustn't. Why? Well... Well, because there's the diamond. George. George, will you please try to make sense? But it's right in the vaults, right next door to the theater. If it's taken, they'll be shooting. Oh, well, if that happens, I'll be in the theater. Oh, that's right. Well, you can't go on anyway. It's a rotten play. You're sure to be a failure. Well, what if I am? Failure's a terrible thing. Oh, George. George, darling, I can't stand to see you like this. I wouldn't care for anybody else in the whole world. 
Please, won't you try to pull yourself together? Now, you mustn't be too upset about it, my dear. There are many things we can do for him. I'm going to make him go to a sanitarium. Would that be wise? He's got to get well again. I agree, but I don't think a hospital's the place. What he needs is a change, some place where it's nice and quiet. And what do you suggest? We'll discuss that. Meanwhile, suppose you bring him to the office tomorrow, on any pretext you would think of. Miss Peyton and Mr. Melville are here. Come in, come in. Here we are. Won't you sit down? Ah. What is it, George? Well, I thought I saw a light in the wall. A light in the wall? Do you see a light, Claire? No. I'm sorry. I guess I must be crazy. Come and sit down. Won't you sit down? No, thanks. I'm all right. George, I've been telling Mr. Gregory that you need a rest. You ought to get away. I perfectly agree. You've been working too hard. Oh, shucks, I, I always work hard. Claire and I have begun to worry about you. Please believe us, George. I believe anything. We think a rest at some nice, quiet place will do you a world of, for instance, the mountains. You know, I have a lodge up in the Berkshires. I'd be happy to place at your disposal. Well, thanks. I, I think I'll sit down. You'll have all the fishing you want, horses to ride. My servants are up there. Up where? In the mountains, George. The mountains? Oh, yes, the mountains. I see no reason why you should start uh, immediately. Shall we say early tomorrow? Tomorrow? Early. I know you're going to love it up there. We're coming up Sunday to see you, George. Thanks. If you want Sunday anything, night. just send me a wire. Bye. seeing you. Everything snug here? Everything's swell, Tommy. Did they tell you? They figure I'm just a fellow to finish up the war for him. It's lasted too long. I think it'll be over in a couple of hours after I... That's a way to talk. Well, thanks, Joan. I... Lord, Joan, how can you bear it? It's more than I can take. Tommy! I'm afraid. I haven't got the legs to take me up to the front. I can't make it. Tommy, get up. Maybe I'm not a man because I don't want to be shot full of holes. Maybe I'm not a man because I want to live. Listen to me. We're all in this and we've got to stick. It's going to do some good, Tommy. It's going to prove that there must never be another war. That's what you're fighting for. You know what you mean to me. If you went back now, you could never face me again. I couldn't bear it, Tommy. Did I say two hours? I'll have the war finished in 20 minutes. Oh, wait for me, kid. Keep looking for me. It's a long way to You know when you are to remove this painting? I know the cue backwards and forwards. Not long now. How are you feeling? Fine. This is our act, Ridley. How are the nerves? Never better. Ready?
upstairs. Come on. Maybe they've killed him by now. Now, wait a minute. Take your time. I don't know what you're talking about. I want you to get in touch with the police at Hemmettville, New York. That's in the Berkshires. That's where they took him. Who took him? Blackton Gregory. He's Belaya. He just stole the Sunburst Diamond. Holy mackerel. It happened five minutes ago, but I don't care anything about that. You've got to save a man's life. Now get on the phone and do something about it. Tom. Huh? Did you get the painting, Chief? What are you talking about? I gave you your instructions to get it. Yes, but when I went up for it, it was gone. So that I thought that you were going Can't to... impossible. Did any of you? No. Drive back. Yes, sir. Don't touch that. Stand right where you are. All right, boys. Fathead, so he didn't know what he was talking about, hmm? Let me tell you one thing. If he's dead, it's your fault. It's my fault, too, but it's your fault in the first place. The sunburst diamond was stolen tonight, just as he predicted. You know who stole it? Blackton Gregory. He'd have told you that, too, if you'd given him half a chance. He may be dead now, for all we know. And let me tell you, you're going to print that story and you're going to put his name on it. You're going to say that he predicted it and he's the greatest man that ever lived. Well, you big fool, what are you just sitting there hey, for? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait, wait a minute. minute. Keep the load of the trucks. The editions will be out in the street three minutes. Great. So, you wanted us to do something for your fine young man? You've got to. Okay, lady. Read that. Spectacular theft of Sunburst Diamond. Hey, Commercial hey, device. hey, wait a minute, huh? Charlie. I said read it, not gargle it. Spectacular theft of Sunburst Diamond. George Melville promises early apprehension of Andrew Berlea. So? He wrote that? Your fine young man is alive and kicking. When did he write it? This morning, in a back room. Where is he now? I don't know any more about that than you do. All I know is, look. Promises early apprehension of Andre Berlea. Now, don't ask me how or why. He promised. And I'm waiting. Hello. Oh, oh hello, George. Yes, you did. Huh? Mr. Melville, I think you're the lowest. Was that my little girlfriend? All right, George. Go ahead. George Melville captures Berlea. Now, unless that's the headline, word for word, you don't get the rest of the story. Okay, okay, that's the headline. Now give it to me, will you, and be quick about it? Berlea will be let out of here in about five minutes. Now get your cameraman right down the theater. I hate you. Hey, hey, get off there, you... Is that you, George? I love you, sweetheart. Hey, who are you talking to? To the grandest little actress that ever lived, on or off the stage. George, George, give me some facts, will you? What did Berlea say to you? I don't know what Berlea said, but do you mean to tell me you were acting all this time? Put out of this, you! Darling, that little hoax you pulled on me was the inspiration for everything. All I am or ever hope to be, I owe to you. And now we're even. Yeah. Now we're through. I, I say, can I count on that? Well, I predict that within five minutes... You predict nothing. I'll do the predicting from now on. The whole world's waiting for this. Let him wait. I'm going to make a prediction that will make Melville look like an amateur. I'm going to make him suffer for the rest of his life. Wait a minute, Chief. Get this. This will be good. And what are you going to do, my love? I'm going to break somebody's neck. What am I going to do? I'm going to marry you. That's what I'm going to do. George, what did Berlea say? I love you, darling. <laughs> George, what did Berlea say? I hate you, darling. Uh -huh.